Good morning. When somebody asks you uh, what you did on the weekend, you'll be able to tell them that you got some financial advice from God. It really is my privilege uh, to preach over the next two weeks on what can sometimes be a tricky topic, the topic of money, in our mini-series, Wealth at Wild Street. Next week, we're going to turn to 1 Timothy, do an overview of wealth, but focus on wealth in the household of God, wealth here at church. But this week, we're going to begin by focusing on the heart of the matter, our hearts. And we're going to ask, where does generosity come from? And because we want to begin generously, we'll begin by stretching our horizons and considering global generosity. So next week, wealth here. This week, wealth there. Global generosity. My prayer is that God would speak to us in this mini-series about far more than money, that he would teach, rebuke, correct, and train us in righteousness so that when it comes to wealth, we at Wild Street would be generous near and far, complete and equipped for every good work. So will you join me in asking this of God our Father? Will you pray with me? Generous Father, speak to us now about your Son who was rich, but became so poor for us. Teach us, reprove us, correct us, train us in righteousness so that we might be good stewards of the wealth you've entrusted to us here at Wild Street, so that we might be complete and equipped for every good work that you have equipped us for. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So greed, it comes naturally. But where does generosity come from? You know, I never had to teach greed to my kids. I think there's a picture of them coming up on the screen, Martin. Uh, Is that right? There they are. They're cute, aren't they? They are cute, but sometimes they're basically seagulls. Yep. Everything is mine, 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 mine. Greed comes naturally. It grows so easily. You know, my kids are only just starting to see ads. Uh, But every single day, the average adult, you, are bombarded by between four and 10,000 ads. Random jingles and images piling desire upon desire to fan the flame of our greedy hearts. Did somebody say? Menu log. Wash the cat? Next one. Treat yourself. I don't care. Anyone? I love it. Man, St. Matt's Botany, they had that all down. (laughs) It says something about me and maybe St. Matt's Botany that all of our ads, my ads at least, are food related. What do your ads say about you? You know, my kids haven't had to give much thought yet to the global economy, whether greed is good or whether there might be something bad about the colonial, rapacious plundering of impoverished peoples forcing an estimated 45 million people today into forced labor. Greed comes naturally, grows so easily, and once it grows to the global scale, greed never has enough. America first. Russia trying to take what it wants. Australia, one of the richest nations that has ever been, endlessly anxious about making budget. Is it any wonder that Jesus speaks more about money, more about greed and generosity than he does about sex, violence, or even heaven and hell? In a world where greed comes naturally, where does global generosity come from? It's an important question for us here at Wild Street as we consider our place in God's global generosity Where does global generosity come from? And it was an important question for the Apostle Paul as he considered his Corinthian problem. You know, Paul had proclaimed Jesus all around the known world. I think we've got a map coming up for us, yeah. In Achaia, you can see it there where the Corinthians came from. In Asia, where the Ephesians lived. And in Macedonia, you can see it kind of up there in the middle. You've got the Thessalonians, but also the Philippians from our major series. So when you think Macedonians, think Philippians. Paul has been preaching the gospel out in the world for a long time, but now, decades on, 
Paul hears that way back in Jerusalem, the poor Jewish believers, who he calls the saints, they are doing it tougher than we in our wealth can imagine. These Jewish Christians, who are already hard-pressed by persecution, but now famine has come, and it's leading to widespread poverty. So Paul came up with this plan. He wanted to take up a collection to gather goods from the nations, from the non-Jewish believers for the Jewish believers. And not only would this meet the Jewish need, but it would prove to the Jews and to everyone else that the faith of the non-Jewish believers was a genuine faith, a generous faith. And at first, the Corinthians, they were eager to give. They made a pledge to provide for the poor in Jerusalem. But over time, the Corinthians lost interest in global generosity. They forgot the poor in Jerusalem and all about their pledge. And that brings us to our passage for this morning, where Paul solves his Corinthian problem by stirring them up to global generosity, where we will find an answer to the question, a source of global generosity that not only makes pledges, but fulfills them. So feel free to use your outline, keep your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where we see that the source of global generosity is not a guilt trip, but a grace trip. Not by guilt, but by grace. Look at verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. So Paul's a good missionary, he's always got a story to share, and he wants to tell these Corinthians what happened when the grace of God showed up in the churches of Macedonia. Many years ago, there was this conference in Cambridge which was comparing different religions. Experts from around the world were debating what sets Christianity apart until a scholar named C.S. Lewis walked into the room, he heard them debating, he said, that's easy, it's grace. Grace is what sets Christianity apart. Grace, undeserved, unmerited, unearned generosity. Grace is not us being good enough for God, climbing up to heaven with our good deeds on a Buddhist eightfold path or in submission to Allah's will. No, grace is our God coming down, spending himself in his love for us giving himself to us, even though we have taken and taken and taken again. So Paul begins this second letter to the Corinthians with grace to you. He boasts that in his ministry he has behaved by the grace of God. He appeals to the Corinthians not to receive the grace of God in vain. The next one, I think. And why? Because, and now this is one of Paul's reasons for writing this book of 2 Corinthians. Next verse. It's all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. That's the next one, I think, Martin. The whole Bible, let alone this letter to the Corinthians, is just bursting with grace. Just as God promised to bless all nations, just as God so loved the world that he sent his only son for us. So Paul's vision for grace is global. Grace might extend to reach more and more people who are less reached and so increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. That's why Paul will finish this whole letter with the famous and revolutionary prayer asking that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ might be with you all. That is a revolutionary prayer, a dangerous prayer, because, well, what happens when God's grace shows up? Brothers and sisters, has God's grace shown up in your life? Has God's grace been at work here amongst us at Wild Street? How would we know? Well, look at verse 1 again, where we see just what happened when God's grace was given amongst the Macedonians. Because by grace, even those beggars beg to give. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, 
their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have have what? I mean, what does severe affliction plus abundant joy plus extreme poverty equal? And how did joy get in the middle of that equation? Well, when the grace of God shows up, joy abounds. And this crazy equation, you see what it equals? A wealth of generosity. That is some pretty crazy math. The Macedonians, think the Philippians, they were poor. They were persecuted, facing a massive test of their own affliction. And when God's grace showed up, it didn't take them out of their own affliction. It didn't remove their poverty. There was no beefing up of their bank accounts. In fact, it was quite the opposite. God's grace poured into those Macedonians whose joy burst the bounds of affliction and poverty and an abundance of joy overflowed, literally abounded. Same word in Greek. An abundance of joy abounded in a wealth of generosity. A wealth of generosity because, just look at verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. These Macedonians gave beyond their means. They gave more than they could afford. I think we like the idea of generosity, but only if it won't cost too much. When was the last time that you gave something that cost you? I'm not talking about sliding your spare change into the Macca's donation box or rounding up your nearest purchase to the dollar at Coles or Woolies. When was the last time you gave something that cost you something you want? Because you helped out at Wild Street Mission, you couldn't make that holiday away with your family or your friends. Because you invest your money in mission, you had to cancel that subscription to Netflix, Spotify, Disney+, Plus, Stan, Hulu, Amazon, Prime, HelloFresh. Or you had to give up your daily coffee. It used to be three bucks a day, a thousand bucks a year. Now it's more. Now, you might say, as I can see my wife um, saying to me in my mind, Seth, coffee is more than a want. Coffee is a need. But did you see those Macedonians? They are giving so much that it's costing them not only what they want, but even what they need. They are, verse 3, giving beyond their means. Reminds me of that story in the Gospels when Jesus stopped to watch that poor widow put her two coins in the temple treasury. We're told those two coins was all that she had to live on. What was she going to eat that night? Now she can't afford what she needs, let alone what she wants. Although that's not entirely true, is it? Because both the Macedonians and that widow, they, did, they both did exactly what they wanted to do. Because when God's grace shows up, what they wanted was to give extravagantly, generously, beyond their means. Verse 4 tells us just how much they wanted to give. Look at it there. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Wow. In a severe test of affliction, in the midst of extreme poverty, these Macedonian beggars are begging to give. It puts a whole new spin on take my money. I've got a friend uh, from America who told me the history of his church. During the Depression, right before World War II, this small, impoverished church ran a prayer meeting. Every week, these poor believers would get together to pray and encourage each other. And one week, someone stood up in that prayer meeting, and this is what they said. Life is hard for us, but how much harder would this be if we didn't have Jesus? And so, this small church in the middle of extreme poverty decided to give more than they could afford to give, and they sent out their first missionary in the middle of the Great Depression. Have you thought about the limits of your generosity? I mean, I find it easier to be generous to my family, friends, maybe my church, 
maybe strangers I can see. But these Macedonians, they were begging to give globally. Not to their local church where they could take part in some benefits. Not to their own ethnic tribe, but to the relief of the poor Jewish Christians who they'd never met far away in Jerusalem. Wow, that is global generosity. As Paul says in verse 5, that is not what he expected. This, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. When God's grace is given, when God's grace grips the hearts of his people, they don't just give their money or their time or their expertise or whatever. You know, they give themselves first to the Lord and then to his apostle. Have you given yourself to the Lord? Have you taken your dreams and your gifts and your plans and your priorities and given them to the Lord Jesus? The missionary martyr to China, Peter Torgerson, he was only 18 years old when he sat in a service just like this and uh, he was gripped by God's grace. And a collection was taken up at the end of the service and he emptied his wallet into that plate And he added a piece of paper on which he wrote three words. And my life. Because when God's grace shows up, by grace, even beggars beg to give globally. Grace is the source of global generosity. And Paul gets so excited by what's going on in Macedonia that he calls to the Corinthians to join the party. Come on, Corinthians. Verse 6. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he'd started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. The Corinthians, they excelled. And this word for excelled is the same word that Paul has used for the Macedonians' abundance of joy and their overflowing generosity because the corinthians excelled they abounded they overflowed in so many gifts like us here at wild street they had faith they knew jesus they would live forever with him they were reached they were richly resourced they had speech they had rod i mean paul and eleanor and josh and Andy, and Kurt, and Cooper, and tons of Bible study leaders, and musicians. They had knowledge, small groups, and conferences. They had earnestness. They even had the love of the apostle. And Paul didn't even mention money, which we know many of them had in wealthy Corinth. Yes, the Corinthians excelled in everything. So they should also excel in this grace, this gift that makes all the other gifts work. Generosity, because gifts are for giving, near and far, local and global. That is why God has given them to us. God has given you your gifts, not for hoarding and storing up for yourself or ourself. No, to excel in everything, to have every gift, but this gift, this grace of generosity, would be to waste everything. Now, I'll be honest, if it was me trying to solve this Corinthian problem, I think I'd resort to a guilt trip or I'd start making some commands. But it's a good thing that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was writing this. Look at verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. See, Paul isn't just giving commands. He isn't guilt tripping the Corinthians. He wants their love to prove itself genuine as he compares them with the earnestness of others. By grace, even beggars beg to give. Come on, Corinthians. Because global generosity doesn't come from guilt. It comes from grace. And Corinthians, you know grace. And so Paul composes one of the greatest memory verses of all time. And it's not only another example of grace, it is the example of grace, and it is grace itself. Look with me at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that you by his poverty might become rich. Oh, he was rich. All things were made by him and through him and for him. Every mountain and every molecule, every star in the sky and every shell in the sea belonged to Jesus. But nothing could compare with what he had even before anything was made. For he was always in very nature God, equal with his Father who loved him and the Holy Spirit who bound their love together in perfect unity and glory from all eternity past. Oh, he was rich. Yet for your sake, for the sake of all who would call upon his name from all nations, In the greatest act of global generosity, yet for your sake, he became poor. Our Lord left the heights of heaven to be born in a stable. He borrowed a boat to preach from, a donkey to ride on, a room for his last supper, a tomb for his body. And on that cross, our Lord Jesus spent himself crucified on a cross of wood, though he made the hill on which it stood. For your sake, he became poor, so poor, we weren't even his friends. And he spent himself for us, so that you, by his poverty, might be rich and share his glory all eternity. Oh, if the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want to make you give your life and your wealth away, nothing will. But Paul's not done. And what he does next is not what I expect. Point two, giving globally is good for you. Look at me at verse nine. Look with me at verse nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you? Paul doesn't tell the Corinthians how awesome it would be for those poor Jewish believers to get some money. No, he tells the Corinthians that global generosity would be good for them. This benefits you. Global generosity is good for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that thing Jesus said when he said it's more blessed to give than receive? I think that's what the Macedonians believed. We skipped over it, but it's back there in verse 4. Look at me at verse 4. Those Macedonians were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Come on, Paul. Please let me give. Don't rob me of this favor. In Greek, the word for favor is grace, the same word. Do you see global generosity as a favor, a privilege, a grace? These Macedonians, they are grace junkies. Grace was given to them, And now they are begging for more, begging Paul for a part in the grace party, begging Paul for the privilege of giving globally. Paul says, in this matter, I give my judgment. This benefits you. And then he spends the rest of the chapter eight and the next chapter nine explaining why generosity, global generosity, would be so good for the Corinthians. I want to show you just two reasons why global generosity is so good. All right? Two reasons. True prosperity and global thanksgiving. First, global generosity is good for the Corinthians and for us because generosity is true prosperity. Jump with me down to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency at all times, you may abound in every good work. Resources are not scarce in God's economy. 
In God's economy, we don't need to grasp at zero-sum gains or live greed's empty lie that there's never enough for me. In God's economy, you don't need to feel inadequate, like you've got nothing to give. In God's economy, you are not the only one looking out for you. No, in God's economy, where Macedonian beggars beg to give and widows offer all their coins, where our rich Lord Jesus became poor so that you might be rich, in God's economy, there is always enough for every good work. God is able to give all grace, all sufficiency at all times so that you may abound. Don't you want to abound? To live a life abounding in every good work? Don't you want to reap bountifully? Then sow bountifully. Give your gifts away. And not so that you can have more to keep. I mean, that's the problem with the so-called prosperity gospel. Give your money to Reverend Dollar and God will make you happy and prosperous and wealthy and beautiful. I had to use my American accent for that one. Give your money so that you can get, because getting is where the fun's at. What a lie. Giving is where the good stuff is. We know that. Don't you love it when you choose that perfect gift for your family member or your friend? You give it to them, the joy. You know, Christmas is coming, and one of my favorite things about Christmas is helping Josie and Micah buy presents for Kate. Does mom really want that lollipop and that ugly stuffed toy? No, but I buy it for them and we wrap it together. And then on Christmas morning, I get to watch pure joy unfold as they give their gifts away. And they learn the secret that giving is where the good stuff is. No, we don't give to get. We give so that we will get to give some more. God loves to give so that givers get to keep on giving. Because giving is true prosperity. Paul puts it there in verse 11. You will be enriched in every way. To be generous in every way. God is the gift who keeps on giving. So that we get to keep on giving. I want to show a video. Um, which I think Martin will grab for us. Uh, of one of our Wall Street members. Who I think has just grasped this. Who has been enriched be generous in every way, and I don't want to embarrass her, but honor her. So here we go. Maybe. Uh, this Howard and Trisha, in our little small group, to talk about their Bible study, he was especially humbled. 他说的他们都退休了应该像清楚的年龄年纪了而抛弃这么优越的生活去那么遥远的陌生的地方这个是一般人做不到的是什么给他这么大的运动就是神神对他们召唤而我虽然是个新的基督徒我不能像他们一样
you might be a two-coin widow, more of a poor Macedonian than a wealthy Corinthian, sweating it out in a not-so-fancy gym, taking money out of your retirement savings. But even then, you will get to give. And this promise that true prosperity lies in giving, that sooner or later God gives cheerful givers more to give, is a promise secured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus from the dead to life everlasting. Because even if you sow your last breath with Jesus, you will reap his bounty of heavenly reward and share his life forever. The great missionary and martyr Jim Elliot once said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Sometimes you'll be giving out of poverty and the price will be high but the prize will always be more than worth it. Finally, giving is good for the Corinthians and for us because global generosity will succeed in its goal of global thanksgiving. Look with me at verse 11, where we see the results of global generosity. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. A lot in there, but do you see how confident Paul is that if the Corinthians give generously, not only will the needs of the poor saints be met, not only will there be this bond of love between the poor Jewish believers longing for and praying for the Gentile believers, but this gift will succeed. It will overflow in many thanksgivings to God. That was Paul's purpose statement back in chapter 4 when he said, it's all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul says, come on, Corinthians, give, and the globe will overflow with thanksgiving. I love that for Paul, it is all interconnected. Giving is good for the Corinthians, good for the saints, good for God, good for all others. Did you see that in verse 13? Somehow, this particular contribution isn't just for the poor saints, not just for them, but for all others. It's a truly global vision, a butterfly effect of a gift that keeps on giving from then till today until the world is full of thanksgiving to God for his inexpressible gift. Paul, he had a Corinthian problem, but he took them on a grace trip. He showed them that by grace, even beggars beg to give because global generosity is good for them, true prosperity, and good for all others, global thanksgiving. And if you're wondering, yes, those Corinthians dug deep and they came to the party. They realized what they're missing out on and they kept their pledge. And global thanksgiving has erupted across the world. What about us? I mean, obviously, we are not first century Corinthians. Paul isn't asking us to take up a collection for the poor Jews in Jerusalem. No, we are 21st century Australians meeting in one of the wealthiest suburbs in the world. Some of us have a lot. Others, a little. Don't we all want a part in this grace party in global generosity? Wild Street. Don't you want true prosperity that erupts in global thanksgiving? Well, we don't really take up a collection here at Wild Street, do we? We don't pass around a bucket or something like that. So you can't just empty your wallet or put um, the three words and my life in the bucket. But maybe you're new today and you would like to find out more about this crazy grace that changes us Uh, And we would love for you to join uh, Josh and others in the life course. That would be a great way to find out more. Or maybe you're ready today to give your life to Jesus this morning, to turn away from living selfishly and turn to the one who was so rich but became so poor 
that you might join him in his riches. Do not put that off. I would love to pray with you. Anyone here would love to pray with you. Or maybe you're already a Christian, but you've been challenged today that you've been living more like the Corinthians than the Macedonians. You want a part of the grace party. You want to give something that costs you. You want to experience that it really is more blessed to give than receive. Or maybe you're just like the Macedonians and you are begging for more of the global generosity grace. Let me share just two opportunities, two opportunities for generosity, which we have here as the Wall Street community. Here's the first one. I didn't know this. Don't know if you knew this, but Wall Street gives 8% of its wealth annually, globally. 8% every year out to the nations. I think we've got a picture of the mission partners coming up. Look how many mission partners we get to support. How many different parts of the world we have the privilege of being generous to. Wow, Howard and Trish in Belgium, Josh and Nikki in Indonesia, Candace and the Kongs in Melbourne, so many more. You can find out more on the mission board over there if you haven't looked at it. And did you know that another 2% of our wealth every year goes to Greenfield Ministries here in Sydney, places even in Sydney where people just don't have as much as we do. So if you want to start giving or give more to Wild Street and join us in sending at least 10% of our wealth out to generously bless the world. If you're wondering how to do that, because we don't talk about money very much. We don't bang on about it. We're careful to be considerate about the way we choose money, but sometimes maybe not talking about it has meant we haven't helped you to know how to do it. Did you know on your um, leaflet handout thing, uh, there are some details there. Uh, you can find those online as well. And I'm told, though I must confess I've never seen it before, that there's a box at the back somewhere where you can give money if you still use the, those you know, coins and whatever. Um, so apparently it's back there somewhere. We don't talk about money very much. But we're missing out if we don't know how to join in the generosity of our community for the sake of the globe. Give globally so that through our missionaries, people would hear about Jesus, they would grow in Jesus, and there really might be a globe that overflows with thanksgiving. Now, here's a second opportunity in the second slide, Anglican aid and compassion. I think before I came, or maybe just as I was coming, you saw the, um, the Madagascar video of what God was doing there. So exciting, right? Anglican aid and compassion are great organizations that help us leverage our wealth here for the poor all around the world. These are Christian organizations, but they also uh, that, that meet earthly needs, but they also help um, the poor who they meet their earthly needs of to get to know Jesus and his irresistibly good grace that lasts forever. Uh, Rod or Josh or anyone would love to speak with you if you had questions about how you could invest in caring for the poor through either of those organizations. Those are just two opportunities. There's lots more. And I reckon over morning tea, we could discuss this. How can we be generous with our wealth? Wild Street family, do not miss the chance to get on board with God's global generosity. And I'm giving you some homework for next week. Here you go. Ready? I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, Rod. I'm gonna, just going to do it. All right, yeah, okay. Uh, homework. I'd love for you to re revisit your budget this week. Have a look at your money. See where it's going. Have a think. Come prepared next week as we come back again and think about wealth here at Wild Street. Spend time reflecting this week on all that God has taught us, that by grace, even beggars beg to give globally. Come on, Corinthians, you know grace, because by grace, giving globally is good for us. True prosperity and global thanksgiving. Thanks be to God.